welcome. And uh, it's been a joy my entire week in Dubai, and I will definitely be back very, very soon. I have about 30 minutes. I will take 20 of those on the presentation and try to save a little bit of time for your questions. Uh, my name is Tom Bates. I come from the traditional Wall Street environment. I spent about 10 years working at companies like Bear Stearns, JP Morgan, MSCI, uh, mostly in the risk modeling space, but also uh, on the trading side as well. I, I left those jobs to be a self-employed trader and uh, really fell in love with cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. And now I travel around the world and try to educate people. You can find my YouTube channel just under my name, Tone Base, and I organize three events. Hopefully, we'll bring a few of them to Dubai. Unconfiscatable, the Financial Summit, and Understanding, B uh, understanding Bitcoin website, understandingbtc.com. All right, there we go, it's working. Okay, so I just want to briefly go through the history of Bitcoin, and then uh, we're going to talk about what makes Bitcoin so special in relation to the traditional environment. Uh, the position has a white background, I hope everybody can see it, but otherwise maybe we can dim the lights a little bit if possible. And uh, what you see here in the background uh, is the entire price history of Bitcoin up to a couple of months ago. Sorry, I think I have to click that thing. There we go, okay. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto released a white paper in, uh, on October 31st, and the first Bitcoin transaction took place uh, a few, about a week, uh, about a month after that. And what he did was he solved a problem in computer science. It was a problem that many people tried solving and gave up, but eventually uh, he solved it. It was the solution to a double spending problem. We all we all send digital messages all the time. You send text messages. You send pictures. Um, you send word documents. But prior to what Satoshi invented, that digital data was always copied. You would send a copy of a picture. You would send a copy of a text message because you retain an identical text message. He found a way to send data, and the sender loses possession of that data. And he knew that this was going to be so powerful that the best application for it would just be digital money to challenge the traditional financial system. And in this presentation, we're going to talk about how it challenges the financial system. Oh, boy. Uh, no, there'll be, a, there'll, be, there'll be a lot of slides, but I'm going through them quickly. Um, wait, so are you clicking or am I clicking? You're clicking, so this is, oh no. Okay. So, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll do the best I can. So, after Bitcoin launched, for the first year and a half, it was actually worthless. People were spending electricity trying to mine Bitcoin, uh, but it didn't have any market. It's first real use case was censorship resistant value transfer. And it happened uh, in very late 2010 when there was a website called WikiLeaks that would publish a lot of uh, the bad stuff that the US government was doing, most the US government. And the US government didn't like what WikiLeaks were doing. They didn't like seeing uh, the videos from the Iraq war and some of the other ones. And WikiLeaks was all donation based. So what happened was that the traditional financial system, based in the US, cut off WikiLeaks from any funding. They got cut off from Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, and the only way WikiLeaks was able to sustain itself was by taking donations in Bitcoin. And right there, Bitcoin proved its first use case, that it is money that you can send to anyone in the world, and no one can do anything about it. They can't stop it. Uh, so that was the first use case of censorship resistant value transfer. That's when I first heard about Bitcoin, but it wasn't enough for me to really, really get interested in it. Um, after that news broke, a few months later, a website called Silk Road launched. And the government did not like that website either. It was a free market website where people were able to buy anything they wanted, but mostly it was narcotics. And uh, that was Silk Road, it's part of the history of Bitcoin as well. Again, 
another use case of censorship resistant value transfer. It was a payment that nobody could stop. Again, I heard about that very briefly, but once again, because I wasn't interested in what was being sold on that website, it never resonated with me. Um, Bitcoin had its first bubble and it went all the way to $30 in 2011 because of those two things. And one of the politicians in the US went on television and complained about the Silk Road website. So here he is pulling out the Silk Road website, showing what you can buy on there, and basically doing a tutorial of how people can buy on there by uh, saying that you have to go through Tor, and then you have to use this currency called Bitcoin, and then you can buy uh, certain things that are illicit. And that was probably the greatest tutorial on how to use Bitcoin ever, and he was able to do it in about 30 seconds. And this presentation is 30 minutes, so it kind of shows you the big difference. All right, so sometimes this works and sometimes this doesn't. There we go. Okay. Uh, so that drove Bitcoin to its first bubble. Now we come to 2013. 2013 was probably the best year for Bitcoin ever. 2013 proved a very different use case for Bitcoin. And this particular use case was the one that got me out of my seat, well, still working at a very intense job on Wall Street, saying, whoa, this is not good. And that use case was from Cyprus in the European Union, when in uh, March of 2013, the Cyprus banks shut down and the government confiscated 50% of everybody's money above 100,000 euro. And that actually took place. So when that happened, that's when it hit me. Wait a minute. So you earned money legally, you weren't using Silk Road, you weren't doing something illegal, you earned money, you saved it in a bank, you were saving for a business, you saved 200,000 euro, and all of a sudden, here comes a bank bail-in, and 50,000 of your 200,000 euro at the bank, the government just takes for themselves, because the banks are in financial trouble. So that's what happened in Cyprus. And that's when I realized that there needs to be an unconfiscatable asset. And that's what, uh, and here's another example of that, uh, of Bitcoin uh, being useful. So in America in 2014, and it was the last time somebody was allowed to do the statistic, law enforcement confiscated more money from Americans than burglars. So more money was taken by the police from people than uh, bad people, than robbers, stealing it from their home. Okay, so again, when the money is in Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin becomes an unconfiscatable asset. And, and it's awesome that I was able to secure unconfiscatable.com, and that is something we've never had before. People have never owned anything that has been unconfiscatable. Uh, if you own real estate, you know, another country invades your country, they can take it or uh, your country has a way to take it. Uh, your car, your home, your money at the bank, as was proven in Cyprus. But not Bitcoin, because you can store Bitcoin in your head, and uh, you don't have to tell anyone you even have it. And that is probably its most powerful feature. However, if you don't properly secure it, uh, or you leave your Bitcoin at a Bitcoin bank, then it has the same properties as the traditional money, because now someone else is basically holding on to your Bitcoin for you, and now they can take it, or they can be hacked. Of course, you could also be hacked. In the case of the Silk Road, that Bitcoin was not very properly protected. So when the government shut down Silk Road, they were able to confiscate 144,000 Bitcoin, which they sold for $48 million. Had they waited a couple of years, that would have been worth 2.4 billion. And had this article waited about a week, that would have been about 4 billion, because it was written right at the top of the 2017 bubble, okay? So, so that does take us uh, to, the, uh, to the bubble of 2013, uh, which at the end of it, there was a big failure of an exchange called Mt. Gox. I'm not gonna get into 
uh, the details of that exchange in this presentation as, as to how it went down. Uh, so we're just gonna move on a little bit further. And Bitcoin went through a bit of a bear market uh, until the next big event, the, the next big financial event in 2015, which was the failure of the Greek banking system. And this failure of the Greek banking system put both of the properties of Bitcoin on display, unconfiscatable and censorship resistant. Because when the Greek banks shut down, people were not allowed to touch their money. Uh, they were only allowed to withdraw 60 euros per day. 60 euros per day, right? So we can multiply that by four. So imagine only being allowed to withdraw 250 dirham per day from an ATM machine. No matter how much money you have in the bank, that's all you are allowed to take out. And the rest, the government is holding on for you very, very safely. Uh, after a couple of weeks of that, they decided to allow people to withdraw 420 euros for the entire week. So what happens that Monday morning, oh, next slide. So what happens that Monday morning when you're allowed to withdraw 420 euros? Everyone runs to the ATM machine in order to withdraw their money. And these pictures, And these pictures, uh, as you can see up there and down here, are no different than what has been happening throughout history with the financial system. Uh, the pictures up there were from the uh, United States in uh, 1907, the, probably the biggest financial crash the United States had was the 1907 crash, led directly to the creation of the Federal Reserve to prevent these kinds of crashes, which ended up leading to the Great Depression in 1929, so that didn't help. Uh, that middle picture is Germany, uh, where the money was more useful to burn for heat instead of using it. Uh, 1934, when the U.S. removed the gold standard uh, from the money, same thing, people wanted to burn the money. And we go full circle to back to color photography of Zimbabwe, where they went through their hyperinflation as well uh, with the destruction of the money. Since I already mentioned uh, the separation of the U.S. dollar from gold. Uh, let's go to what happened in the United States in 1933, because this is the third very critical property of Bitcoin uh, that allows it to compete with the U.S. dollar. In 1933, all of the gold was confiscated, but it was easy to confiscate that gold because no one was walking around paying in gold. The gold was sitting at the banks while the US dollars that people were using were backed by gold. So at the time, uh, the government did announce that there was a $10,000 fine and up to 10 years in prison if you did not turn in your gold for, uh, to the government because it was illegal for people to own gold. They never actually went around to confiscate it from individual people. Uh, they were able to just take it all from the banks because the banks were holding it on behalf of the people. And there's a really good book in the crypto space called The Bitcoin Standard that describes uh, all of it well. I'm just going to read a couple of quick things from it. People, if people chose a hard money with a high stock to flow ratio as a store of value, their purchasing of it to store it would increase demand for it, causing a rise in its price, which would incentivize its production to make more of it. But because the flow is small compared to existing supply, even a large increase in new production is unlikely to depress the price significantly. Hard money, by taking the question of supply out of the hands of governments and their economists, would force everyone to be productive to society instead of seeking to get rich through the fool's errand of monetary manipulation. International economic summits are convened where world leaders try to negotiate each other's acceptable currency devaluation, making the value of the currency an issue of geopolitical importance. For every other money, as its value rises, those who can produce it will start producing more of it, whether it's rice stone, seashell, silver, gold, copper, or government money. Everyone will have an incentive to try to produce more. Bitcoin is the hardest money ever invented. 
growth in its value cannot possibly increase its supply. It can only make the network more secure and immune to attack, and it makes Bitcoin fundamentally different from every other money. So in quick summary, the three properties of Bitcoin that allow it to compete with the traditional financial system today are unconfiscatability, censorship resistance, and the fact that it, you can't inflate it, you can't print more of it. Uh, this year alone, 23% of all US dollars have been printed in the, since uh, COVID happened. With Bitcoin, you could, would not be able to do that. Uh, several, many governments around the world just shut down the economies and paid people not to work. With Bitcoin, you can't do that. You can't just print Bitcoin. Uh, so the economy, the world economy would have kept functioning. Uh, yes, we would have had to deal with COVID. Yes, people would have had to be careful. But it was crazy when the government says, your business is not essential, but his business is essential. So he can work and you can't. And of course, Amazon has the big advantage because they deliver to your house. Meanwhile, a small business needs people to walk into the store. Now, uh, let's skip that, let's skip that because I'm low on time. One more? Okay. Uh, so, where is Bitcoin still struggling a little bit but getting much, much better? Well, scalability and fungibility privacy. So, fungibility is really, really important. Uh, the uh, thousand drill note in your pocket needs to be identical to somebody else's. It needs to be just as equally accepted. So that's fungibility. It's really, really important for a functioning economy. Privacy is always nice. Your money is your money. Uh, no one should control how you want to spend your money that you have earned honestly and legally. And scalability is the ability to use Bitcoin for small transactions. This has always been one of its challenges, but it is getting significantly better um, over time. I'm going to skip a couple of slides that talk about that. Uh, where is Bitcoin still struggling? It's obviously still struggling with volatility. Uh, Bitcoin is volatile. We just witnessed a 50% crash in its price uh, over the last few months. But its trajectory has been up because it's a scarce asset. And as people discover more and more use cases with those three properties I already mentioned, there will be more and more demand for Bitcoin. However, here is a giant list of hyperinflations uh, countries whose currencies have basically been destroyed uh, in the 20th century. And since this book was written uh, in 2007, oh, can we go back one? Since this book was written in 2007, all the ones in blue are the ones that I had to go out and find just in the last decade. And I did this about five years ago, so we can probably add a country or two to this list since 2008, uh, 2018, when I put the rest of this list together. And these are all the hyperinflations recently. Uh, Ukraine and Russia, when they had their little, when they had the war in 2014, uh, we're witnessing what's happening in Turkey, Zimbabwe again, uh, and uh, Venezuela. Uh, everyone hears about that quite often. That's still going on. That's the Venezuela. That's Zimbabwe. Now, hyperinflations are mostly political events. I'm not gonna uh, get into. Uh, that right now on this presentation. This is why while the United States has printed 25% of their money recently, they have not yet gone into hyperinflation because the world still has confidence in the US government. But after the 2020 election, we'll see how long that will last. Uh, there are also significant shocks in other currencies, like when the British uh, decided to vote for Brexit. There was a 10% shock in their currency in one day when the Swiss peg broke against the euro. That was a 33% shock in a European currency in a single day. So we can't say that Bitcoin is the only volatile currency there. There are numerous examples of others which are equally as bad. Bitcoin's biggest problem, however, is its security. Uh, Bitcoin can still be hacked and uh, securing your own Bitcoin to be your own bank is still not very, very easy. Uh, one day, maybe it'll be simple enough for grandma, but right now it's still a little bit of a challenge. All right, so I got about five more minutes, and I'm gonna talk about what do I think will cause this huge wave of people to actually start adopting Bitcoin globally to actually replace the traditional financial system. 
So prior to 2020, my biggest catalyst for this was going to be the European Union. I don't believe the common currency of the European Union is sustainable going into the future. I always anticipated those countries to go back to their common currency that they had before the Euro. Mostly because each country, uh, there, it's not like the United States when the states merged. Uh, in Europe, each country has their own language, has their own culture, and they have their own uh, economic systems. Greece and Italy are not like Germany or um, you know, Latvia, countries up north. So I always anticipated the potential breakup of the European Union. When that happens, eventually, people in those countries, they're, they're not gonna even trust their own currency. They're gonna try to convert those euros in anticipation of that event uh, in order to run into a safer asset like Bitcoin. Another major catalyst is the current global push to eliminate paper money. Uh, that is very, very strong right now. The elimination of paper money, almost every government uh, wants to eliminate that. And uh, there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, one of them is our government can set any monetary policy that they like, negative interest rates, sure. We'll charge you negative 5% on your money in the bank if you're not using it. Uh, again, people will want to retain the value of their money, so they're going to try to hold on to it. Um, another reason is there won't be any of those pictures. The pictures that I was showing earlier, people rushing to the bank to withdraw their money from an ATM, there'll be no ATM machines. There's no need for them. If there's no paper money, there are no ATMs. There is no run on the bank, as they like to call it. Those won't exist. Those will go into the history books. And finally, every government that has ever existed, um, probably except this one because there's really no taxes here in Dubai, but any government that collect, collects taxes from its people thinks that all of their people are always cheating on their taxes, and that's why they haven't given them the most perfect utopia the world has ever seen because everyone cheats on their taxes. Well, in reality, it doesn't matter how much taxes they collect, uh, they are not very good at managing other people's money. Uh, okay, so let's skip these because this is more of a war on cash presentation. And finally, uh, the massive money printing that's going on, the destruction of many economies in 2020 due to COVID, uh, the printing 23% of all US dollars, and US was one of the more responsible countries in the world, Canada printed significantly more, and so did other countries. So massive inflation is not gonna help either. Uh, the, dis the distrust in the government, the U.S. election, I feel, was not very fair, and that's what the U.S. had going for it. Uh, the U.S. was a world reserve currency because the world trusts uh, the U.S. government, most transparent uh, political system, most transparent economy, but if that trust is lost, uh, then the U.S. dollar will no longer be the world reserve currency, and what happens next? We don't know, they're talking about a basket of goods, but in the meantime, oh, can we go back one slide? Uh, that was, uh, one more, back one more, back. In the meantime, corporations already started moving their cash into something safer like Bitcoin. This also needs to be updated. MicroStrategies has bought a lot more. Uh, Tesla sold 10%, Square and several other companies bought more. Uh, that is the end of my presentation. I do recommend these three books, if anybody wants to take a picture of these three books to understand Bitcoin a little bit better. Uh, the Bitcoin Standard talks about the history of money for 11 chapters, and the last three chapters talk about Bitcoin as a potential future. Uh, the little Bitcoin book is very, very short, just tries to educate about Bitcoin. And Bitcoin Clarity tries to explain the technology side of Bitcoin in a layman's way. Uh, thank you so much for listening to the presentation. My name is Tone Vase. You can check me out on YouTube. Uh, also, uh, Unconfiscatable is a conference in the US. Understanding Bitcoin is a more technological event in Malta and maybe one day in Dubai. And the Financial Summit is for traders and investors. Uh, thank you. I don't know if I have any time for questions. I may not. Uh, <laughs> I will be here tonight after taking that young lady to the airport, and then I uh, will be back, and um, hopefully I'll still get to see everyone and talk to you guys uh, a little bit later. Thank time. you very much. Yeah. He's going to the airport. He'll be back. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So.